Um, I wanted to get this on camera because Trey spilled Jenny's water and as we got done, she wiped it up and said, don't slip. And I was like, I'm a thug, I don't slip. <laughs> You're supposed to laugh because I'm not a thug. <laughs> also, thugs can still slip if, if the ground was wet and they weren't wearing their proper shoes, so. Okay, thank you. So, you know, if it's icy out, you know, the ice does not care if you're a thug or not. You know, like a homeboy on uh, Home Alone 2. Remember, with the paint, he's like, anyway. All right, I'm just waiting for the iPad to catch up. So, we are in part two of a three-part series. Um, I guess next week is not really a uh, part of a series as much as it is a culmination of things. Um, as Lee said earlier, next week we will be washing feet. I will be washing feet. Um, it is something that has weighed on me since I was eight years old, about eight, nine years old. Um, my dad, church was about this size, um, and he washed the feet of the people. And there are a lot of things that I remember my dad for. Um, I say that like he's not alive, he's still alive. Um, there are a lot of things that stick out about my dad when I think about him. Um, and that is one of them. And that has carried so much weight with me watching my dad kneel down and wash the feet of every person that went to our church. Um, and it stuck with me so much. I am a pastor now, and for the last two years, I've been trying to avoid washing feet. Um, if you are like me, feet's not really your thing. You're like, Jesus, why like feet? Can we wash hands where everybody washes their hands and then I wash their hands, you know? Um, how come you didn't do that, Jesus, you know? Um, but it is, it's one thing that has stuck out to me, gosh, for years and something that I know, I've known that I need it to do. And so um, here we are. And so next week we will do that. We'll come in, we'll do announcements and music like normal. And um, I'll do a little blurb. I'll read through John 13 further, expound on it maybe like two minutes, which really means seven minutes. Um, and then we'll wash feet. We'll take communion as you are ready to take communion. And I think we'll set up on the stage back there. And as you're ready, uh, just come back and get your feet washed. And I'm gonna say some things to you. Um, Jesus and I are gonna decide what that looks like this week. Um, but I'm pretty excited, pretty excited. So we are in part two. Last week we talked servanthood and being a servant, what it means to be a servant, what it looks like. Um, so voluntary service implying obedience and devotion derived from the idea of being bound to something. So we learned last week that every time we see, I am a servant of Christ, or you should be a servant of Christ, or submit yourselves as servants of Jesus, this is what he's saying. Make yourself a slave, a slave to Jesus. You have no rights, you have no opinion, you have nothing, you are here just to give. Voluntarily is the big piece of that. So Jesus is not forcing us into slavery. He's saying you made this choice and because you make this choice, this is what your life should look like to Jesus. We said last week, we love to say Jesus is my Lord and my savior. And what we really mean is Jesus is my savior and he's awesome. Because when we break down the word Lord, the person who has uh, authority, influence, and power over my life, yeah, too much. Like, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, Jesus is my Lord. You know, we said Whitney Houston, that's my God, that's my Lord. <laughs> Which is not actually Whitney Houston, it was a sketch for Matt TV. Anyway, <laughs> but we said Lord, when I actually look at the word Lord, he needs to have somebody who's going to be a servant. He needs a lot of people who are going to say, I will voluntarily obey and be devoted to you and tie everything in my life to you, Jesus, my Lord and Savior. So, 
If we are to be servants of Christ, we need to read and study, pray and walk with those that are trying to do the same. If we're going to call Jesus Lord, we need to obey and be devoted to the things that he says and wants us to do. Last week, we looked at Jesus doing this, and we're going to go further into Philippians 2, verses 1 through 8 today. Super excited. One of these days, we're going to have like proper not lighting over here. Shade, as some would call it. You know, curtains. I call it not lighting. It's fancy. <laughs> Sound like a caveman. Philippians 2, 1 through 8, it reads, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The key to all of this is humility. Let's look at the deets. Verse 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Pause. Do nothing. Do nothing. Do nothing from a selfish motive. Do nothing from a selfish motive. Already too much. Jesus, this is not what I signed up for. Can't do it. Nothing. Sometimes I'm hungry and I want to eat. Well, not that selfish. Like, please live, you know, like, please live your life. But do nothing when it comes to other people. When other people are involved with my food decision, do nothing from selfish motive. Nothing. Verse four, he says, in humility, count others more significant than yourself. In humility, count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you not only look to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. We're gonna break down humility in a bit. But he says, in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. That means at any given moment, I should be striving to do more for those outside of myself in every relational situation. In every relational situation, I should be striving to put others before myself. Every single relational situation, I should be striving to put others before myself. Not just the people that I know and not the people that I love, but the people who we all think we have a list who don't deserve to be treated with more significance than I'm going to treat myself. And we know that they don't deserve it because we know their thoughts, we know their motives, we know their hearts. We know their history, we know where they come from, we know their family, we know all the details, right? We know everything about everybody that doesn't deserve goodness. No, we don't. And because of that, he says, you have to treat others more significantly than yourself. It doesn't matter what they look like, it doesn't matter what they sound like, it doesn't matter what they say to you, it doesn't matter what they do to you. He says, in humility, this is what you need to do. I should be looking at every single person with more significance that, than myself. Take how you feel about yourself and what you want, the good, multiply that by any positive number other than one, and that's what you should give to other people. Simple math. If you, right now Trey is like counting two, three, four, five, eight, 
That's where we are. Use his math. It don't even make sense, but it's more than one. So whatever I already feel about myself and what I feel I deserve, what I feel Rafer deserves for Rafer, I need to multiply that and give that to Breck. I need to multiply that and give that to Skylar. I always wonder how preachers like say that. It's really hard to find people's names as you're preaching. It's weird. It's like, I know his name, Breck, yes. <laughs> Breck, that's his name. You guy, you know? <laughs> but what I feel about me is what I need. I need to give more than that. At the moment I go, I deserve this, is the moment that you deserve what I just said I deserve. That makes sense? And again, we have a lot of lists. We have a list of things that we deserve and we have a list of people who don't deserve those things that I deserve. Whether we like it or not, we have a list of people who do not deserve the things that I know I deserve. But he says others, not any type of per like not any specific group, all the groups. Everybody, all the time. Don't look to your own interest, but to the interest, interest of others. This is very hard to do. And frankly, not a lot of us want to do it. This is one of those things where it's like, yeah, well, I, well, you, you reign above it all. You reign. Remember that, Jesus? You just, you reign above it all, you know? But when it comes to me flipping the script on my attitude and how I look at people, it's a different story. So how am I supposed to do this every day, every moment, in every situation? Paul says, have this mind which is yours in Christ Jesus. Have this mind among you which is yours in Christ Jesus. We leave the part off that says which is yours in Christ Jesus. So we're stressing out going, Jesus, how am, I, how am I supposed to treat people like that? How? But remember when they, remember when, when Jesus, remember, that's what we're doing. And then we go to small group and we're like, I'm struggling at work, man. These people just, but I am not in Jesus. He says it's in Jesus. If Jesus was a treasure box, it's sitting in your living room and you're like, well, I guess I just got to try to find some humility. It's in Jesus. Breck, two weeks ago, said, yo, stay connected to the vine. And he used a very great visual. He had this super magnet and these little metal plates. And he goes, yo, connect to the power, connect to the source. And when you connect to the source, everything you need is there. You have no power by yourself. You have no humility by yourself. You can't treat others more significantly than yourself by yourself. You can't do it. So if I am having issues going, man, my thoughts are not good in, in my thought, like my thoughts to others are not good. I need to connect back to the source. It is that simple. And we just toss that part out the window like, like it was never said. We're just like trying to do this Christian thing and we're like, well, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. Yo, it's in Jesus. Simply in Jesus. If I want to see the fruit of humility in my life and I want to see myself treat people better, I have to stay connected to Jesus. So when I stand up here and go, hey, I'm going to wash everybody's feet, Jesus, Rafer has immediately stepped outside of Jesus to realize he doesn't like people's feet. That is outside of Jesus. In Jesus, it's not even an issue because my heart for the people and my heart for my Lord and my Savior and what he's called me to do changes the whole landscape. Crazy enough, I literally felt the peace as I said that. So I will stay connected to Jesus as we talk about foot washing. He said, have this mind which is yours in Christ Jesus. All I have to do is talk to Jesus. 
once a day, twice a day, 86 times a day, whatever you feel, you need to stay in Jesus. You do that. And I guarantee you, you will see the fruit of what you do with Jesus in your life. I promise you, you will. He gave us the example to follow. And it's a literal pattern. Jesus took the form of a servant. What? We just talked about this last week. Jesus took the form of the one who said, I will voluntarily serve and be obedient and devoted to the will of the Father like a slave. And Jesus did it so he could show us that it can be done. He didn't do it because he said, yo, watch how I do this. You want to be connected to the Father? I'm going to show you how to be connected to the Father. But you have to be willing to be obedient and devoted Excuse me. Further, he humbled himself. He humbled himself. I'm just going to skip to the definition. Jesus humbled himself to lower in dignity or importance. That is the verb. He humbled himself. He lowered himself in dignity and importance. I'm just going to let that one sit because we all have, we are Americans. So I'm going to just say it. We're Americans. Oh, dignity, importance. Yeah, I have it. Yeah. Okay. Lower that. What? Okay. Okay. I always thought I was active duty six years and I always thought it was interesting that we as America have like land in so many other countries, you know? Could you imagine France going to the US government saying, yo, we wanna set up shop in Texas. All y'all that just laughed, you are American. You're like, that's not happening. <laughs> okay, <laughs> no way, dude. <laughs> no way, it's not gonna happen, no way. We'll set up <laughs> shop <laughs> in your country. Do you understand that people in the military will be stationed in other countries on a U.S. base? Pick up cannon, put it in whatever country you want to, and that's, that's the real situation here. So we naturally born on U.S. soil have a lot of dignity and importance. And I think it is harder for us as American Christians to actually live a life of humility in Jesus because of what we already are in, what's ingrained in us. Bow down? No. To who? Get on my knees? Okay. We say it all the time, kneel before the cross. But then you actually tell people, yo, get on your knees and bow down. Uh, well, I kneel in my heart to the cross. I kneel and, you know, you know. To be humble, having or showing a modest or low estimate of one's own importance. As I was typing this up, it hit me so big. The only time we do that is when we self-depreciate. That's the only time we actually look at ourselves with a low estimate of our own importance. Oh, I'm a mess. I'm a hot mess today. Why are you taking the picture and putting it on Facebook if you're a hot mess? <laughs> that doesn't, like, I'm just going to say to, like, in myself, I go, if I look a hot mess, I'm not taking a picture and posting it. Because if I'm posted, guess what? I'm good with posting it already. But the only time we are humble is when we self-depreciate. We're not humble when it comes to other people. We're not trying to look at ourselves as lower. That's the problem with churches today. For a long time, preachers are standing up here and going, well, I don't have to be humble because you have to be humble. I'm not gonna lower my importance. No way, me? I'm the preacher. Why would I lower my importance? Why would I look at you and say, we're on the same page? You're not up here preaching. Why would I do that? And so now we have a generation of people who are like, preachers are fake. 
Churches aren't, they, they don't know what they're doing. I don't want to do that. Everybody's fake there because we show up and we have a false low estimate of our own importance because we're not in Jesus. So we have to, Sir, you want me to do it one more time? I'll say it again. I'll say it again. Because we're not in Christ Jesus, we have to show up here and we have to like, oh yeah, it's good, you know, oh yeah, oh no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. You take communion first. It's like, that's not a thing, like, that's not true humility. And that's just the definition in the dictionary. The biblical, to make oneself of low condition, to become poor and needy with contrition or penitence. Essentially, repentant heart. So this flips the script from me being humility, hu humble for the sake of others to my humility before God. Because if I now need to be humble with a repentant heart, that's not necessarily what I'm doing all the time with the people that I see on a Sunday morning. That's my relationship with Jesus. Interesting enough, the same word is used in Luke one time in this version is talking about making a mountain flat, patting down a mountain. One, it's a lot of work to like take a ground thing flat. I don't know. I'm from LA. I don't use my hands. These hands are for baking, you know. <laughs> Take a ground thing. Is it called a leveler? I don't know. You know what I'm saying, well? Tamper. Tamper. Boom. This is, this is why we need each other. <laughs> Prime example. A tamper. That don't even feel right saying it. That's how I don't, how much I don't know, you know. Anyway, taking the tamper and flattening a mountain. That's what this word is. Taking a tamper and flattening a mountain. Boom, 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 boom. How long does that take? You're the mountain. You're the mountain. To make oneself. In the English dictionary, it's just what it is. Oh yeah, he's humble. To be this. But the biblical version says, I have to make myself do this. To make oneself of low condition. That implies that I don't want to do it. So now that you know you don't want to do it, get back to Jesus and he will help you make yourself humble. That's super tight. Super tight. Oh, Jesus did this, right. I was like, okay, cool. So Jesus made himself of low condition, made himself of lower importance. And he showed us how to do it so that we can do it. We say all the time, Jesus is my example. I wanna be like Christ, he's my savior. Heck yeah, let's do it, Jesus. And he's like, remember that time? No, not the servant word. No, not humility, no. Like, remember that time I was serving people? No, Jesus, what about like, let's just like heal people. Like, you wanna go from zero to healing people like with zero humility? I always say, every time I don't preach, this place is like legitimately packed. Every time. <laughs> you know why? Cause Rafer enjoys being up here. Yes, Rafer was called to do this, but Rafer enjoys having a captive audience for any amount of time. <laughs> so Jesus has to humble me so that this can actually be what it needs to be. He has to have things happen that Rafer doesn't have his hands on. So Rafer can see, just be like me, son. Just be like me. Just be like me. Remember the example. And the moment you think it's too hard, remember this mind is yours in Christ Jesus. CJ said it at the concert. If I have free money up here, cash, and was like, yo, first person who wants it, come up here and get it, y'all be running up here. 
Ironically enough, his son was the only one who ran up there and there was no money. <laughs> I was like, what a, what a three-year-old. He was like, money? You know? I got up to the altar. <laughs> Tricked ya. Time to pray. But it's yours in Christ Jesus. It is yours to have. So what does it look like in action? We already read Philippians 2. Do nothing from selfish ambition, but in humility count others as more significant than yourself. Look to the interests of others, not your own. Colossians 3, 12 through 17. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, I'm already talking to God's chosen ones. You don't have to become God's chosen ones. I'm talking to you, God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. Put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against the, another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. The reason that we have a hard time having fi find having the reason we have a hard time finding real relationships in church is because the expectation is come to Jesus and then we'll make you better. We, the church, not Jesus. And once you're better, then we can like be real friends. And so what happens is we don't bear with each other because we can't show up and go, yo, I'm lazy and sometimes my wife gets mad at how lazy I am. Rafer, don't say that. You're a pastor. Well, it's the truth. Ask my wife. But because we can't say that to each other, we have to put up this false humility, these false pictures of what's going on and who I am. But the moment that we are all these things, compassionate, kind, humble, meek, and patient, it now creates a culture that I can bear with you what is going on in your life and mine and yours. You, you know, you get what I'm saying, vice versa. Words are hard today. Ugh. <laughs> Bearing with one another. Guys, if as a church we cannot, one, bring people to Jesus, and two, love them until they love Jesus as much as they can ever love Jesus, which is never gonna be measured because you just keep loving Jesus more and more. But if we can't truly just meet people where they are and love them through all the things, what are we doing here? If we can't bear another's burdens, what are we doing here? I'll say it all the time, go find another church. Because we are not going to be the church where we can't show up and be real. Multiple times, Jeannie and I have had people come to us on a Sunday morning and tell us what they did on Saturday night and here they are at church. Most of it involves partying and we're like, why are you telling us this right now, this morning? Because I need help and I don't know how else to say it outside of saying the truth. Because there are no Christian words to say, hey man, I got a hangover from last night, but I'm here. Because you can't like doll that up, you know what I'm saying? Hey, yeah, we had a good time last night. No, because if you're saying that, Jesus in the room is just going to make you say it. But Jesus needs you to know that I'm not going to go, oh, what, and you stepped into the church? <laughs> He needs you to see a pastor that's going to go, hey, that's what's up. I would have been there, but I got two kids now. <laughs> that's better than last week. That's better than last week. 
I won't. But I go, Jesus says, I need, I need somebody who's going to be real enough that we can actually build a culture where we can bear another's burdens, where we can actually give compassionate hearts, we can show kindness. Are we gonna mess that up? Of course we're gonna mess that up. But it's not about focusing on the mess ups, it's focusing on continuing to grow as a church family, continuing to grow for myself in Jesus. First Peter 5.5, 5, it says, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders, Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. If I'm wondering why it feels like Jesus is not close to me, because I am giving him false humility. And he opposes the prideful person. And most of the time we think the prideful person is like, well, I don't need Jesus. No, the prideful person is also, I know you know this already, but I can't say it out loud. Lord, I know you already know it, but I can't say it out loud because it's too bad for your holy ears to hear. Okay. That doesn't even make sense. That's trade, counting to eight. Two, three, four, five, eight. That does not make sense. And that's what we sound like praying to God. Lord, I know you know, but I, just, ugh, I can't say it. It's too much for you, Jesus. He's like, you understand I already died for that? You understand I already made up for that? And so God is opposing us. Not in everything. Because corporately you can show up and feel the presence of God. There are moments you're like, oh, thank you, Lord. But in that area where I will not let him do what he needs to do, he is opposing me. So like I said last week, the people who have been devoted to teaching that is not Jesus and their lives are molded by that, Romans 6, it's the same thing. My life is now becoming this cycle of, I can't get out of it because you're too proud to let Jesus have it. And he is physically, emotionally, spiritually opposing you. God wouldn't do that. The Bible says it right there. He opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. What else happens when I actually Give myself in humility to God. He begins to see me. The next verse, 1 Peter 5, 6 and 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. There are a lot of people walking around with tattoos that's like, cast your cares on him because he cares for you. Cast all your anxieties on him. Get the tattoo that says, I humbled myself, 2017. No, we just want to say, cast all your cares and anxiety on him because he cares for you. He does care for you, but there's a piece to that puzzle that you have to do first. And if I, Rafer, stand up here or go home and I'm too proud to pray for Oasis, guess what? I can't even cast a care or an anxiety on him because I'm too proud to just get on my knees and go, Lord, I can't do this by myself. Would you like to call? Sorry. Siri's on it. She responded like I like, you know. <laughs> Siri like, preach it, you know. Thank you, Siri. Appreciate it. But God sees me when I begin to humble myself before him. When I humble myself before him, God sees me. Remember, those to make yourself low in condition, poor and needy, you literally have to say, God, I need you. I need you, Jesus. Psalms 25, verses 9 and 10. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. He leads the humble in what is right. 
I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I'm just going to do this. I don't know what to do. No, stop. Get on your knees. Lord, I don't know what to do. Will you help me? The humble is the one who gets the path. I just feel so lost. I just feel... Stop feeling that. Just humble yourself before the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards or sees the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. Psalms 146, 8 and 9. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He holds up the widow and the fatherless, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. Everybody in that scripture has something against them that is making them poor and needy and lowly. And those are the ones that God is helping. Psalm 147 verse 6, the Lord lifts up the humble, he casts the wicked to the ground. Psalm 149 verse 4, for the Lord takes pleasure in his people, he adorns the humble with salvation. Because if I know I need salvation, he's get, I'm not going to say it, it's there, you get it. Proverbs 334, toward the scorners he is scornful, but to the humble he gives favor. To the humble, he gives favor. Proverbs 22, verse 4, the reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. People don't even treat me right. You should probably humble yourself because that's a very non-humble statement. Well, people, I deserve... I'm not going to preach these because they're self-explanatory. Isaiah 29, 19, the meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord and the poor among mankind shall exalt in the Holy One of Israel. The meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord. The humble person will obtain fresh joy. That plate that was in the meme was not fresh food. It was hot and ready, like just made. But we talking, you feel different when you eat a good salad versus a three by three from in and out with animal style fries. You feel different. That's what fresh joy is. Fresh joy is a really good salad, not a side salad. Nobody wants a side salad. I'm talking like a real good one, you know? The meat you prefer, the veggies, there's a lot of good stuff there. That is the fresh joy. Because it tastes good and it feels good. And you're like, look, I can jump. I just ate dinner and I can jump. You know what I'm saying? Fresh joy. Isaiah 57, 15, for thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. God is out here trying to meet and do things for the person who will stay bowed down before him who is aware enough to know I can't do this myself. And because I can't do this myself, I need you, Jesus. Crazy part about this, a lot of times in the Old Testament, these are the words that you'll see for humble. Afflicted, meek, lowly, bowed down. New Testament flips the script and it's what I now do and make myself do. It's not something that I am, it's something that I have to consciously be aware of in my daily life. I have to be aware of it. God is only giving things to the people who sacrifice themselves for the will of God. Those who are laying down their own way to obey his word, devote themselves to his word, and give themselves up for the sake of his will and his way. And we do that by humbling ourselves. The more that we make the conscious decision to humble ourselves, the easier it is to humble ourselves. If practicing anything, it is not going to be easy the first time. But I have to get into a rhythm. I have to find my way with Jesus and I have to continue being made low. I have to remember that I am poor and needy. Remember last week, the business of sin is death. 
but the lavish gift? There's an exchange here. Sin is only going to give you death for death. That's it. That's his business. Payment, little death, you get a lot of death back. God has a lavish gift and all you have to do is be humble enough to go, I need that gift. I don't know where I saw it yesterday, but Bill Johnson said this, fire always falls on sacrifice. Be the sacrifice. I was like, dang, bro. Fire always falls on sacrifice. Little snippet, tabernacle, first time it's built, put together, boom, boom, boom. Moses is like, Jesus, we did what you told us to do. Show up, do your thing, thing. Fire, boom, on the sacrifice. Fire always falls on the sacrifice. Every single time you want to see the fruit of your Christian life, you want to see yourself forgive people, you want to see yourself not stressing out, you want to see all these things that we read about in the Bible, you want to see those things in your own life, sacrifice what you want and humble yourself. And fire will fall every single time. So, John 13, and this is our bridge into next week. John 13, 12 through 17 says, When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. I wish this was one of those, like, you should also do the same. And then you could be like, but like, it could be the same as in serving, not wash each other's feet. But he said very clearly, you also ought to wash one another's feet. So there's no way around it. <clears throat> For I have given you an example. All right. Thanks a lot, Jesus. That you should also, that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. The servant is not greater than the master. The master did it, so I'm going to do it too. It's that simple. Obviously, we know and understand the servant is not greater than the master. Duh, Jesus. And then Jesus flips it and goes, look at what the master did. Look at what the master did. He did that. <laughs> Jesus did that. Jesus literally did that. And we, here's the crazy part. We put all this on Jesus. We come in here and like, I made the choice. Jesus, you're it. And then we walk away when the moments get hard and we're like, mm, I know the master did it, but I'm good. Yo, if I really want my life to change and to look like what Jesus said it could look like, I have to do what the master did. I have to. In my voluntary service, I have to be obedient and devoted. I'm tied to him. I don't have an opinion about it. I don't have any ideas of how to do it better. I'm just going to be obedient. So we're going to go into the holy place. And one of my favorite songs, also not my favorite because it has so many things in there. Um, so will I. Listen to the words of this song. And there are so many things that every time I listen to it, I'm like, okay, cool, yeah, check in, check the box, yep, okay, yeah, they raise their voice in praise, yep, I can do that, cool, cool, cool. But the end of the song, he's talking about giving your life over and over and over and over and over again. If you gave your life to love them, Jesus, so will I. 
And it sucks that they put that one at the end because you're like, yeah, so will I. Yes, ah, uh, so will I, ah, uh, so will I. Oh, give my light to love, oh, hold up, time out. Ugh. I was riding the wave of positivity in Jesus. But let that sink in. Because that's where we become better Christians, not better Christians, but like legitimately better Christians. That's where we become the church that we say we want to be. That's where we become this body of believers where it's like, yo, just come to my church. Well, can I? Yes, just show up. People are going to love you for who you are. Just show up. That's where we actually change. When we start cutting out our own opinions, start cutting out what we feel and what we think. And just go, okay, Jesus, you did it. I'm going to do it too. You did it. I am going to do it too. Jesus, you did it. I want to be like you. I'm going to do it too. Being a dad for the last two years has shown me one thing. And I understand why Jesus likens us to children in this relationship. Because my son legitimately wants to do any and everything that I do. Any and everything. I don't care how small it is. I toss the ball up in the, in the uh, toss the ball up, hit the ceiling. He's like, ooh, I try. My turn, dada. You did it, dad? I'm gonna do it too. Oh, dad, dad, my chain, my chain. Yeah, I go put, let's just put your chain on. You did it, I wanna do it too. His hair is nowhere near like mine. I got this sponge thing, you know, He's like, dad, I try, I try. Sure, son, there you go. Dang. <laughs> he just wanna be like me. You did it, I'm gonna do it too. We carrying groceries in, dad, dad, I, I get it, I get it. Here, here you go. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. I'm going to the bathroom all of a sudden. Dad, dad I pee pee and potty. No, you don't. You do, no. That's a sore subject, son. Don't do that. <laughs> we tried that one time, remember? Oh, all of a sudden, you got a pee pee too? Okay. I, I got pee pee too? No. But everything I do, if dad does it, I'm going to do it too. Even if my attempt is as feeble, even if it's not the same, I'm going to just try. Because what is my dad going to say? Dang, that was tight. The other day, we were outside. He's got this ball. It's our balcony. We're out on the patio. He's kicking the ball. We're kicking it back and forth. I just grab the ball, go up, and just dunk, you know, on the balcony. Boom! Of course. I try. Pick me up. Pick me up. I was like, nah, you got to jump, bro. But he wants to do it. He, know he knows. Even though I didn't pick him up that time. Mostly I was on the phone and I was tired. But he knows that I can't do it. But you're the one that can help me do it. You did it. I want to do it too. And if I can't do it, you're going to help me do it. It's the exact same, guys. Jesus is like, yo, just be like me. And if you don't think you can do it yourself, which you can't, I'm here to help you. We just have to step out enough and go, okay, Lord, I'm going to do it. So let's go into the holy place. Go listen to this song, spend some time with Jesus. And um, yeah, we'll go from there.